movement that encourages you to live with less. Less stuff, less possessions, less clutter, and find more joy and more time to focus on what matters. So what is minimalish? It's a grace-filled way of doing the same thing. Sustainable, realistic minimalism that actually makes sense for your life. The Minimalish Podcast is here to help you make life lighter realistically. I'm your host, Desiree, and my passion is to help you create room for what matters to you by cutting the clutter and excess stuff in your home and your life. It's not just about decluttering and having a tidy home, but about how having less stuff will give you more time and more space to focus on creating the life you actually want to live. We'll talk about topics of minimalism, motherhood, simple, intentional living, and everything in between here on the show each week. Let's walk towards simple together. Hi, friend. Welcome to Minimalish. And today I am talking with my friend, Rachel Rainbow. And I cannot wait to share this conversation with you. Today we're talking all about gentle parenting, natural homeschooling, and family adventure. I can't wait to share Rachel's perspective with you, and I think you're going to love this episode. Before we get started, let me share with you a word from a listener today. I am so grateful every time you leave a rating or review on the podcast. This is where I just give your voice some space on the show as a way to say thank you for continuing to listen and share. Today I have a review from Allison Spires and she says, what I love about the podcast is how relatable Desiree is. She invites everyone in with realistic ideas for how to live a minimalish lifestyle. She also focuses on the reasons for reducing one's clutter and the reasons for living with us. I love this balance of relatability and authenticity with practical and thoughtful ideas for how to truly have time for what matters in life. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you for any time you share the show with a friend. This is helping get the word out about the show, and it's helping encourage other moms to live with less and simplify. Minimalish is becoming exactly what I wanted it to be, and that is like a community effort. And I just love the community that is being built through this space. If you're not on our Facebook group, you need to be. You should see the conversations happening and the questions being asked and the encouragement on there. And I just am like my heart is full every time I spend time there and read through your comments and messages to one another. So head over to facebook.com slash groups slash minimalish podcast and join the Minimalish Mamas Facebook group because you are going to just be so encouraged by the other women in this community there. All right, let's get to this episode, and I want to talk to you a little bit about who Rachel is before we get started. Rachel Rainbow is the mom behind the Sage Family Podcast, so she's another podcaster, and you need to check out the Sage Family Podcast. She's a parenting coach, a writer, a podcaster, and an advocate around natural homeschooling, gentle parenting, family adventure, and simple living. She describes herself as a Pacific Northwest adventurer living wild and free in connection with her husband and three children while she balances her nutritious morning smoothies with ample chocolate chip cookies in their fixer upper on the sound. Her mission is to guide and empower families through sleep, parenting, and homeschooling to a lifestyle in which everyone is rested, honored, learning, and thriving in connection. I just think that's such a beautiful mission and I feel like I've learned so much from her through this conversation and I really think you'll feel the same way. The topics that we approach in today's episode are topics I just haven't really talked much about on the podcast because I just don't have expertise in them. And especially when we talk about homeschooling, I simply don't have much experience in that. However, I have been personally curious about the option of homeschooling for several reasons, some of which you'll hear in this episode. We also talk about the benefits of minimalism and simplicity and gentle parenting. And the part where we talk about gentle parenting really feels like a coaching session. And I think you're going to love being in on our little parenting coaching session that was happening there for a minute. What I want you to remember today as you listen is that there's a thousand different ways we can parent. And there are so many different ways to do school. There's no one right way. And that's one reason I love to invite different moms and experts on the show to talk about what works for them. My goal is always joyful motherhood and joyful, simplified family life. 
So I love to share perspectives with you that I believe fall in line with that. And Rachel's perspective certainly does. Rachel and her family do things really differently than the mainstream when it comes to schooling. And she walks us through that a little bit and her reasoning behind it. We talk about the problems in the public school system and the institution of school as it is right now. And I want you to know that this isn't a judgment on anyone who chooses to send their child to public school or anyone that works in a public school. My husband is a public school teacher. What I want this episode to be for you is a big love-filled encouragement to question the norm. I want it to feel like an invitation for the mom who hears from teachers that her child is being a problem at school or wonders if she did something wrong and why her child just isn't doing school well. And I want it to be an invitation for you to reframe that question, that maybe it's not your kid and maybe it's not you. As a former public school teacher, I believe I can say this with expertise and credibility. The public school system is surely not working for every child as it is right now. So take that for what it is and rest assured, if you have a child struggling in school, you are not alone. And this should not reflect on the goodness of you and your child. Now, with that said, change doesn't happen unless we talk about it and unless we urge change to happen. Though there are several options for ways to do school, some of us may need to rely on public schools as the main way to educate our child. Or maybe that's just what we want to rely on. So let's keep talking about this. Let's keep talking about the change that we'd like to see in our school systems. Let's get involved in our schools. I've seen that schools, at least the one that I, the ones I've been in as a teacher, are leaning slowly but surely to a more student-centered, creative approach. We may have a long way to go to get there or to change an entire institution that has been in place for almost two centuries, but small change is still change. So with all that said, there's just so much goodness in this episode. I think you're going to love when Rachel talks about implementing adventure into family life and how we can do the same. I love, love, love her emphasis on family connectedness and joyful family life. And I just know that you'll love hearing about how her family does life together. So let's dive into this conversation. Hi, Rachel. Thanks so much for being on the show today. I'm so excited to chat with you about all that you do and all that you're about. But um, before we dive into that, go ahead and tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do in case they don't know already. Well, thanks for having me, Desiree. I am excited to be here. Um, Okay, a little bit about me. I have three kids. They are 13, 10, and 7. Um, And we live up in the Pacific, Pacific Northwest. And let's see a little bit about what I do. So I am the woman behind Sage Parenting. I have the Sage Family Podcast. I have books like Sage Homeschooling, Sage Parenting, Sage Breastfeeding, Sage Sleep. And I have online classes around things like homeschooling. And I am a parenting coach. So that's kind of my main jam is that I do online parenting coaching with families all around the world. And that's basically our life in a nutshell. I love the like kind of aspects that you're all about and that you talk about homeschooling and gentle parenting. I was really, I was looking into all of your courses the other day just to get a better feel for what you do. And it just, you have so many different helpful classes and I can't wait. I I do want to homeschool at this point, you know, I'm still making decisions on that. I only have a 19 month old, but that's something that I'm interested in, I should say. So I can't wait to just like learn, keep learning from you um, oh, with thank all of that. You. Yeah. So I, like I said, I love the things that you focus on. Um, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about Sage Parenting. You talked about kind of like what you do with it, but what's your mission behind everything you do there? So gentle parenting, natural homeschooling, and minimalism are basically the three main things that all of my work revolves around. And for me, they blend all together really harmoniously, and it feels like one fully integrated (laughs) mission. Um, But basically, I try and help families get empowered to like trust their intuition and lean into this natural way of living and loving and learning and being with children. Um, A lot of people, when they have kids, they sort of hear this voice and feel this pull to parent in a certain way. They see how their children learn to talk and learn to walk and they want to continue that. But a lot of times they're not quite sure 
how, you know, especially in like our mainstream society today, the, that, that narrative is really loud, <laughs> yeah. steering people the other direction. So I just try and kind of lay out a path that other people can, um, can walk if they feel called to go in that direction. Yeah. And I love that. And I really want to um, focus on talking about kind of your thoughts around homeschooling and gentle parenting and kind of what led you towards that. But um, first, since I also focus on minimalism on this podcast, I'd love to hear a little bit about your minimalism journey. Um, how did you and your family become minimalist? I wish I had like some really profound moment of <laughs> conversion, <laughs> but really I think that I have always um, just kind of been, I don't know if wired that way is the right word, but I've always like in, in a space that is simple and functional and has the things that really bring me joy. Like even as a child, I would feel so peaceful and calm. And if the room had a lot of clutter in it or a lot of things are out of place, I would feel really stressed out and anxious. Um, and so I've always kind of been aware of that. My father, I would say, is a minimalist, though that word has never been a part of his lexicon. And my mother has always been kind of a functional hoarder. <laughs> so I've always had kind of the two extreme um, ends, uh, you know, as influences when I was being raised. And then maybe like five years or so ago, I really came, like found the word minimalism and dove deep in it and learned all about it and read all the books and listened to all the podcasts and did all the things. And that really helped me to clarify and have language to communicate, you know, and, and new ideas to kind of inspire me around this way of living that had always felt really good to me, but I didn't really have a word for it. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Like I've talked to a lot of different women about minimalism and it's interesting how like some of us really are just wired that way. <laughs> then there's like, for me, I've always been like, I've always thought I was okay living in clutter and I've kind of been a messy person, but it's interesting how like minimalism can work well and can really like bring good into the life of like anyone really, I think. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. It crosses the spectrum for sure. And it can be tremendously helpful um, no matter where you fall naturally, like in personality style or what your home looks like today. When you take steps in that direction, I just find that it always yields more peace and more clarity. <laughs> I've never worked with a family and had them like simplify their space and then have them come back and be like, my kid's behavior is worse and I feel more stressed out. <laughs> it always, always improves things because your home environment is really a metaphor for your internal state and your kids reflect their home environment as behavior. Yeah, that's so good. That's so true. Okay, I love that. So I'd love to hear about what gentle parenting means to you. When I first heard that, um, that phrase, I was like, Oh, that sounds so nice. I love like, <laughs> I just love the way that even feels just saying it, like, it, yeah. it makes sense to me. Um, but what does it mean to you? Um, it seems like a huge focus on what you're passionate about. So what does that look like for your family? Um, and have you always like, have you always had this style of parenting? Yeah, so gentle parenting I can, you can kind of describe it like if you were dropped on a deserted island alone with just your family, gentle parenting is how you would parent and like natural homeschooling is how your kids would learn. So it's sort of this, it's kind of the way that we were hardwired as a species to raise our children. Um, and then the same with the homeschooling piece. It's kind of how we were hardwired through millions of years of evolution to learn. So gentle parenting is kind of, um, intuitive. It's, I mean, some people use like attachment parenting in the early years or respectful parenting as kids get older. It basically means um, treating your children like human beings, focusing on connection. Um, so things about like what it would look like. So if my child was having a hard time, the mainstream parenting approach would try to inflate the parent's authority and 
exercise control over the child um, where they would try to punish or reward to elicit a certain outcome, for example. Whereas a gentle parent would probably get down on the floor with their child, meet them right there where they're at, um, connect with them, empathize, a lot of like reflect how they're reflecting their feelings and experiences, and then try and meet the underlying need behind the behavior. So behavior is communication and it's trying to communicate some unmet need to you. So how can I meet this need in this moment in a way that brings us closer together as opposed to how can I do something to this child to get them to do what I want? That's so good because our culture really like I have felt the pressure as a new mom when I'm, you know, anywhere, if, if my child is having a tantrum or if she's just not acting, you know, the, Mm -hmm. I put quotes around like the perfect way a child is supposed to act, (laughs) even though she's literally a toddler and doesn't even know what that means. Um, (laughs) I I feel this pressure that I'm like, where is this coming from and why? Fear of judgment for sure motivates a lot of this, but I've actually found that what elicits the most, um, like unsolicited advice and judgment, particularly out in public is not a child's behavior or even a parenting choice, but a parent appearing to be in distress. So if you as a parent, if your child is throwing a tantrum in the middle of the grocery store and you become really concerned and upset and angry or confused or lost or whatever, lots of other strangers with good intentions will try to step in and <laughs> sometimes that looks like glaring or telling yeah. you you really need to spank that child or whatever because they're uncomfortable with your distress. But if, like, if my child were to throw a tantrum in the grocery store, I would just push the cart to the side of the aisle, sit down on the floor beside them, you know, offer a hug, tell them I, I see that they're really frustrated in this moment and it looks like they really wanted to climb that shelf and it didn't look stable. So I said we had to keep our feet on the ground and I know that looked really fun to you. And I'm just really calm and I'll ask like, do you want a hug? Do you want to sit in my lap while you tell me about it? And if I am calm in those moments, all of the people around me, they just, they give me a smile. They, you know, it it really is based on like, if you are confident and content in your parenting choices, that emanates from you into your child. So then they feel calm and content and connected with you. But then also to the strangers around you, they feel like, oh, she's, she's doing, she's doing this right. She's doing what works really well for her family. Yeah, I love that. That's so true. It's there's so much that like, you know, we have to let go of as as moms, especially in the early, early years, like I'm in like really early motherhood. I just I've had to really let go of that. Okay, I don't need to worry about what other people think of me. And yeah, make those, you know, do what's right. Do what works for for you and your kids. Mm. And it I creates just, this spiral where like if your child throws a tantrum and that's just an example, I don't even like that word, but let's just say yeah. your child throws <laughs> a tantrum in public, like rather than focusing on your child, you're focusing on all of the other strangers around you on this perceived judgment that's probably not even happening. But because you're focusing on that, like your heart rate spikes up and your cortisol gets dumped. And then that creates more stress in your child because they mirror our emotional state. So then their volume gets louder and their stress gets higher and their cortisol levels raise. And then that tends to cause you to rise up to try to control the situation more, which causes them to rise up and reclaim more of their, it's just this like cycle of doom. (laughs) Whereas if you can stop and just be the state you want to see in your child, I mean, it's magic making. (laughs) Yeah, that's awesome. That's beautiful. So with with that, like with this kind of style of parenting, that's just maybe like this, this natural state, if there wasn't any judgment, you know, and if there Mm -hmm. wasn't any of our, you know, culture influence, um, did, was this something that you knew, like, square one, this is what, this is the approach you wanted to, to go for with parenting? Or was it something that, like, you kind of fell into in some way? Yeah, well, when my, I think when my child was first born, 
I heard, I mean, even in the hospital, they're like, okay, we need to take your baby and put your baby in this box over here and your baby can't be on you while you're sleeping and all these things. And I was like, no, 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 absolutely not. Like my baby's going to stay with me. And, and so I, I think I had a very loud voice in my head, sort of guiding me in a certain direction, but Then as soon as I brought the baby home, I tried really hard to like be a quote unquote good parent. Like we had set up the nursery. I tried to put the baby in the crib and I just had a total mental breakdown (laughs) because it wasn't working. All of those things, you know, that I imagined and envisioned about what a perfect baby would be like and what a perfect mom would be like, like none of that was working for us. And then there was this moment where my baby was crying in the crib and I was clear clinging to the monitor in the other room, just bawling. And my husband was like, if the baby wants to be with you and you want to be with the baby, why are, why are you doing this? Yeah. And I, I, it was just the light bulb turned on. I just threw the monitor, ran in, got the baby. And then I just dove deep into all the research about parenting. And I had been like a quote unquote parenting expert for many, many years up to that point. But even despite all of my degrees and all of my decade of experience and hundreds and hundreds of families I'd worked with, I was missing the connection piece, which is like the main, because I had never before been a mother. And that, that main ingredient just... It changes everything. When connection is the priority, everything else really falls into place. So then I just read all the books and got all the words, you know, like gentle parenting and attachment parenting and respectful parenting that helped me expand in this whole and and grow into this whole new direction. Yeah, that's really cool. And I love that. It's just something that you really started learning about just by what your instincts were as a mom. Um, So let's talk about homeschooling. And I want to know kind of what went into making that choice for your family and how and when did you become so passionate about this? And like specifically, you know, natural homeschooling, we'll talk about, I want to talk about that a little bit too. So tell me all the things. (laughs) (laughs) Well, when my firstborn was like quote unquote school age, it was time to start kindergarten. Everything about it felt wrong to me. Like this kid's been with me 24 hours a day and learning like voraciously and passionately for all of these years up to this point. And now I'm supposed to hand this kid over to a total stranger. You know, I mean, I've never even left my kid with a babysitter. We didn't know, like, I'm supposed to leave them with total strangers in this massive industrial complex of kids we don't know. It just, everything about it felt wrong. Like, my kid's supposed to sit quiet and still in a chair for, like, six hours. I mean, the kid's never done anything like that. But I told myself, like, this is, this is what everyone does. Like, and side note, like anytime you hear yourself using that rationalization for a parenting choice, like (laughs) all the warning (laughs) sirens should go off. Like that is not a good reason to do something because everyone else is doing it. But I, I didn't know there was another option. Like at the time, my oldest is 13. So homeschooling, like I had never really I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know anyone who homeschooled. My vision of homeschooling was kind of like the Duggars, you know, like, Mm. (laughs) and I knew that that wasn't us. So I didn't really know that that was a viable option. I didn't know that I had another, that there were other paths to walk. So I researched everything I could within the school option and made a choice and put our kid in school and all of the things that I assumed, you, you know, sort of all of my fears came to fruition in the sense that I, I figure I didn't see a way for it to work for my kid, but I figured it must just work out, you know, because everyone does it. Like all of these things that don't make sense to me, they must make sense once you're on the other side and you're in it. And they did not make sense. (laughs) It didn't work very well for my kid. Um, My kid who had been so lively and passionate and just wanted to learn all the things. My firstborn was reading at four just because they loved books. and, And then as soon as they got into the school system, that light was just slowly going out. Um, our, our whole lives became about the school, 
um, like schedules and obligations. And we were all pretty miserable. Um, and then one day, I, I don't even remember the specific thing. My, my kid was upset about something. And I just said, like, do you want to just not go back? <laughs> you know, what if we just don't go back? And my kid was like, please, please don't make me go back. And at that point, my firstborn was in second grade. So we really gave it the old college try, kindergarten, first grade, and a half of second grade. And then I pulled my kid out. We started just homeschooling through the district. They had a like homeschool program where they were doing the exact same work just with you. And then we would meet with the teacher once a week. And so we literally took this child's exact same work and we did it at home. And it took us like three hours to do a week's worth of work. So the first thing I was thinking is like, oh my God, why is my kid locked in this, in this facility for like six hours a day, five days a week? That's like 30 hours a week when we can do all of this work in like three hours. Um, so that was my first big light bulb moment. And then we started getting back out into the world and going on nature hikes and spending time with other homeschoolers and living life out in the real world and having these enriching experiences. And my kids light just turned back on and they just became really passionate again and wanted to learn all the things. And now we had the time to learn all the things. Um, and it just really solidified like that first year of transition. I just learned so much, mostly from my child, but then also of course, like diving deep and reading all of the books and combing through all of the research and, then as time has gone on, we're now what most people would call unschoolers for the most part. Um, and like I said, that's kind of just if you were dropped on a deserted island, how would you can learn? That's basically what we do. So it's um, self-directed learning. You know, they find things they're passionate about and they learn a lot through living life and following those passions. Yeah, I love that. And I love that you were like in these, you know, you gave it a try. And in these few <laughs> years, you just realized like, this is really not working for my kid. If you are a writer or you enjoy writing and you want to be able to call yourself a writer, and maybe one day you want to write a book or you just want to start a blog or something like that. I just want to tell you about something that I've been doing over the past month. And that is I've been a part of a group called Hope Writers. This is a membership group that is all about supporting writers. And I want to tell you about something they're offering right now. And it's available to non-members, which they don't ever do this, but they're making some of their courses available to non-members in a summer writing bundle. So the summer writing bundle includes their course, The Perfect Writing Day, which will help you learn a writing routine that works no matter how much or how little time that you have. They'll be including their course, 90 Day Direction, which is going to help you learn the basic components that you need to take the next step in your writing. And they're also going to be including interviews with three top agents, sharing their secrets to help you craft your proposal, land an agent, and get a publisher's attention, and an editor bundle, learning what editors look for in a book, what to do if you have a small platform, how to write without becoming overwhelmed by the publishing business. You can get access to all of these in the Summer Writers Bundle. And if you want to check out more about it, Go to DesireeEndries.com slash writer. That's DesireeEndries.com slash writer. And there's also a link to this in the show notes. I really have loved being a part of Hope Writers. I found so much value in it. If you consider yourself a writer or you want, you want to be able to consider yourself a writer, this is for you, friend. So check it out and let's get back to today's episode. I was a, te I was a teacher in a public school for four years. So mm -hmm. I have like... When I, when I talk about homeschooling, it's funny because my husband's a teacher. He's a um, phys ed teacher. And so he gets to do the fun stuff. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I was a teacher in a middle school, so it's a little bit of a different perspective. But still, I saw that that there's just so much distraction that goes on in a classroom and not that, you know, not that the school, not that school is bad, but, mm -hmm. but it's just that it doesn't work for every kid. And, you know, if there is this opportunity and this desire to go a different direction, like I think the problem in what I've seen when I've even talked about homeschooling with other people and my child, like I said, is 19 months old. So it's not like a real thing we're even talking about yet. But, but when I even talk about it, what I see is that 
that even today when homeschooling has, you know, gotten a little bit more, like, you know, more people are talking about it, more people are doing it. It's not that school is bad, but it's such the standard thing that you're supposed to do, send your kid to school, that, that people think that, that homeschooling is just this, you know, that maybe homeschooling is bad or that it's not, it's not the, like, it's not even a viable option when, when the school system is just doing things one way and that just doesn't work for every kid. So, so I just love that perspective and how you saw, how you saw what it, what it looked like for your family and kind of just like, you know, did what, what worked for you. Yeah. And I think like when I really started learning more about it and going through like the history of the, you know, educational (laughs) industrial complex came about like during the industrial revolution. And you like read these passages from the founding fathers of mandatory of compulsory education in our country. And you sort of really dive into the history of it and, and all of the structure that lies beneath the surface. It really doesn't service very efficiently the goals that we have for a grown human in our society today. So it served, it was designed around the the industrial revolution, you know, to kind of raise like factory workers, like with the bells and everybody sits and they move from one room to the next at the same time. And you do what you're told and they give you the material to complete. You complete it, you move on to the next assignment. But in today's world, the thing that the the qualities that really make for successful people and the people who are really solving society's problems, they don't, it's not those qualities that we're selecting for in that education system that lead to successful adults. So for example, like valedictorians tend not to be the most successful people in the job market. Um, Because again, like those skills that school is selecting for, if you think of school as like a um, a population, you know, and there are qualities that are, that are selected for. Um, but then when you get out into the real world, we want like creativity and leadership and free thinking and teamwork. And whereas the schools, you know, in the school setting, like there's a lot of individual competition and in the workplace, it's not as much like that. So there are just a lot of reasons why I feel like it's a, it's a more viable option um, than most people are aware of. Like, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about homeschooling too. Like there were for me, like I said, like when I thought of homeschooling, I thought of like conservative Christians who (laughs) don't let their girls learn to read and whatnot. But like the fastest growing population of homeschoolers is actually parents with graduate level educations. Like my husband and I both have graduate degrees. Um, Because we really see, and especially now that I have three children, you know, who all have different needs and learn different ways, I I can see how in our lifestyle, our kids are free to learn the way that they learn, you know, each of them, they each learn different ways. My youngest is very gross motor, like he has to be moving. I cannot fathom in my mind a scenario in which he could sit still and quiet in a chair and write on a piece of paper for hours. Like he's just not capable of it. You know, we have like extremely high diagnosis rates for things like ADHD, especially among boys, um, because we sort of have these expectations that not every child is capable of meeting. Like, and I was that child, like I was quiet (laughs) and Mm -hmm. still And I mainly learn through reading and writing, like I'm a writer. Um, And so I was actually, I did great in school. I didn't have a problem with it. Um, But most people are not like that. Like there's that one learning style that does well in school, but like not everybody learns that way. And it doesn't mean that they're not intelligent and it doesn't mean that they're misbehaving. Um, It doesn't mean that they're a problem. We just need to shift the, I just want to empower parents that if you have a child that has these characteristics and traits and ways of being and ways of learning that are not successful within the school model, you can shift the environment and the lifestyle around them um, such that those qualities are a strength and not not a challenge, not a weakness, not a hindrance. They actually help the child to succeed. 
Yeah, that's so good because I actually was having that um, conversation about like the history of school and like the industrial revolution with a family member a couple of weeks ago. And I was really thinking through it. And it's funny because as, as I I was good at school, you know, I was kind of like, Mm -hmm. you described yourself and I was like a teacher's pet. Even I loved my teachers. (laughs) I I could do it. You know, I could really fit into, I, I can mold to other people's expectations. And I, I guess I kind of liked to at that point, but, Mm-hmm. But it's so then I feel like, you know, I, I became a teacher. I didn't know how to like live outside of that schedule. And then and then once I stopped teaching because I didn't love it, um, I it's within this past year, it's been like, OK, like, wow, I you know, that's not that's not the only way to live and create. And it's interesting yes. how, how that really does like condition you to one way and if you do well within that like that doesn't necessarily mean success and yet we're trying to as like from a teacher's perspective you know we're trying to really like if a kid isn't doing well like we we say that's bad and we try to mold them into something that they're not and yeah I I love this conversation. (laughs) I love that word that you use conditioned too, because it's so true. Even people like me and like you feel like we, you know, our, our way of being and our way of learning was very amenable to school. However, it took me a lot of years and I'm still like unlearning all of that conditioning that I received in school, like that you don't question authority and that you like, it's taken me a long time to de-school is the word that we, <laughs> we use for it. But to like, like, I am still a, and I'm, I'm absolutely like a desperate approval junkie. Like yeah. when I, when I create something that is meaningful and has value, it's like, it's not really valid unless a person in authority like pats me on the head for it (laughs) (laughs) which which I recognize like that's absurd you know like look at all these people that are being helped by my work and yet because that's just that's how I grew up like in the school system just craving the the validation of a good grade or a reward or approval of those authority figures like a teacher um, or a certificate like then out in the real world where for the most part, those don't exist. I then sort of always have this <laughs> hole <laughs> that yeah. I'm trying to like learn as an adult to, to fill on my own, like, you know, but, but it's taken years. And, and this is just as someone who was successful in that system, it's right. taken me years to sort of unlearn all of those things. And then vice versa, like to, to, you know, like not try and people please and to not try just, it, it's been a, a lot of work and part of my motivation in homeschooling. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, so, okay, let's kind of talk about what is that, like, I want to hear about natural homeschooling. Um, you talked about it a little bit, but what what is a day, and I'm sure all your days look a little different, but <laughs> tell me, like, what does a day in the life, I guess, look like as a natural homeschooling mom? Or, like, what does it look like for your kids even? Yeah, so first we wake when our bodies are rested, which yeah. that in and of itself is like a departure for most kids who are quote unquote school age. Um, that was always hard for me, like having to get up super early because I'm not naturally a morning person. And no matter what time I lay in bed in the dark, like I don't fall asleep till late and I don't naturally wake up early. So I would have like stomach pains and I would get migraines. Um, just because that's not my natural body rhythm. You can yeah. only nudge it so far either direction. Um, and thankfully, all of my kids, their natural rhythm aligns with mine and my husband. So <laughs> we usually wake around 10. <laughs> yeah. So that's when we wake up. Um, the sort of what I call the soft structure for our days is something I have called the bucket system, um, where we sit down like once a season with our kids and we go over... Um, what things they want to hold space for, like with time and resources and mentorship and experiences. Um, And so that might be um, like one of my kids is playing the guitar. So he wanted to have like a 
guitar lessons and he wanted to practice each day. So that's like one pin on his bucket. Um, we dedicate like things to physical movement. We dedicate time toward the house, um, toward our pets, toward reading, toward self care. So like brushing teeth, things like that. Um, so each kid, what they're doing looks a little bit different. Um, but we're all sort of here together dedicating time to the things that help us to be our best selves and help our family to run um, in a way that we want it to run and help our home environment to be what we want it to be. Um, and then like my work is basically my, you know, I'm sort of doing all of the same things that my kids are doing, but my own personal version, like I'm reading and I'm um, writing and I'm <laughs> doing this podcast right now, <laughs> um, things like that. So it's really a whole family um, approach to life. It's not even like this whole natural homeschooling thing. It's not something I do to my children. It's just a way of living with my children. So it's something really that we're all doing. And then we often have experiences out in the world. So I run a Hack School Group, which is Homeschool Adventure Club. So one day a week, we are out um, meeting up with all of our homeschooling friends. Like the other, the, the adventure we had last week was we went to this um, museum on a university campus where they conduct all of the research on the animal specimens. It's like their biology department. Um, and so we got to hang out with some of the students there and they went over all the specimens with us and taught us about some of the animals. Um, so just each week we do something different. We're out in a different place, learning from a different part of the community, a different person in the community, or sometimes we're just getting together in nature. So sometimes that'll be like a nature hike or a lake swim or something like that. Um, so at least one day we are doing a hack school event. And then one of our days are classes. So each season, it looks different. Like I said, in that, in that collaboration session I have each season with my kids, we talk about what they want to learn more doing or dedicate some time working on what craft they want to focus on, what new skill they want to, they want to hone. Um, and so this season that is my seven year old does bouldering. My 10 year old right now is doing hip hop and my 13 year old is taking voice lessons. So one day a week we're, traveling around doing those different classes. Um, and then we try to space our week out so that we have an out in the world day followed by two home days. That seems to be about our rhythm where we all function best. So we'll go out and have this amazing experience and be exposed to all these new ideas and have fun, like be super extroverted. And then for two days, my kids will kind of quietly digest and integrate and accommodate all of the new things that they've learned. You know, if we go and we learn all about animals and they'll come home and they'll watch videos about them and read, pick some of the books off of our shelves that are about those animals and they'll play with each other with those animals. They'll build those habitats in their Minecraft worlds, whatever it is. Um, so I, that rhythm tends to work really well for us where we have some great experience, then they have two days to sort of digest it. And then we go out and have another fun experience. That's really cool. I love that, um, that rhythm. And it sounds like it really works for your family. And I love that you kind of are how you said you're not like, it's not something you're doing to them. Like homeschooling isn't something you're doing to them. It's like almost an experience you have as a family, like that mm -hmm. you are working on, you know, your work too. And I'm sure that that's so beneficial for them, you know, be able to be working alongside of you. Yeah. It's not top down. So yeah. like we're like when I'm writing, like we're all around the table together and one of them might be doing Minecraft with some friends through the internet. And one of them might be writing a story and one of them might be you know like we're sort of all in this together like learning and growing and practicing and working on our crafts and it just feels really natural for us yeah that's great um okay so you talked a little bit about this and I just want to hear about it a little bit more because it's something you talk about on your podcast as well is kind of the emphasis you put on adventure and is adventure a part of like your family as a whole, or is it just part of your homeschooling? How does, what does that look like? Um, and why do you have this focus? Yeah, well, for us, I mean, there really is no distinction between like <laughs> homeschooling and life. <laughs> it's just, yeah. This is what living life looks like for us. Um, and adventure is definitely a big part of it. I think part of 
why we really resonate with the word adventure and we really incorporate it so um, diligently is because it really, it, all of our personalities thrive like with adventure. I, my husband is a big thrill sinker and I am, I just thrive with new experiences and all of our kids do too. So like once a month we have a family adventure where we stay overnight somewhere. So basically we've, we moved to the Pacific Northwest a few years ago and we just, each season when we sit down in those collaboration sessions, we make adventure lists. So part of what we talk about is like new places we want to go, new experiences we want to have. Um, and so we make these lists and then like once a month we go somewhere we can usually that we can drive to though. My husband sometimes travels for work and when he does, we go with him. Um, and so we just have these new experiences. Like my husband's last work trip was to Texas. And so we went with him and we explored these underground caves where um, there were these bat colonies and there was a lot of history that had happened there. And my, my youngest loves bats. And so we just, you know, the, we were in Austin. So there's like the bat bridge and they're like, we just, we got to do all the bat things and see, and see all the bats. Um, and he absolutely loved it. And, and it took that interest in bats and really elevated it and allowed him to dive so much deeper into it. And for months afterwards, we, he was still checking out books from the library about bats. And we went to a bat biology seminar and box building workshop at a nature preserve here. That was one of our hack school events. And so he built a bat box. He was trying to attract the bats to our property, but we have eagle, like these bald eagles that live <laughs> in these trees nearby. And so he's trying to figure out how to invite the bats, but not create a <laughs> buffet for the eagles. Yeah. So it's just the, the adventure piece, I think, especially because we have some like high energy, um, people in our family, um, adventure, it just keeps our life fun. It keeps it interesting. It keeps it exciting. Um, and it sparks all kinds of new learning things that we never would have been exposed to previously. When you just drive six hours in one direction, you get to meet new people who have new stories and see new nature and find new animals and plants. And you just, you have this new experience that sparks all of these things that you that you wouldn't have had sparked had you not been exposed to them. Yeah, I love that. Adventure is just something that I feel like you can always learn from and it always mm -hmm. gives your family it just more connection in general. I know that, that having kids will sometimes, you know, cause people to stop adventuring. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it continues to give your kids connection and experiences as you yes. continue. Yes, and that's kids of all age. I think especially when you are parenting within like a gentle parenting paradigm, kids can go anywhere and do anything. You know, like my kids always just napped on me in the carrier, like in my little, in the pouch, we would call it. And we would, um, like, we don't have strict meal times. Like we just have healthy portioned prepped food options available to them all the time. So they're flexible with their meal time. So I think this style of parenting and this style of learning adventure goes really, really well with it. It's a really great compliment. And adventure also has this great frame for hard life experiences. Like even if, if things don't go the way you expected, it's an adventure. Like adventure is really about like setting the intention. I think that's really what the bucket system is for us. We set like learning intentions and living intentions and adventure. Like if you set the intention of adventure, so the goal isn't like to get to this place at this time and complete this tour. Like the goal is just to have an adventure. And so we set the intention to move in a certain direction, but whatever happens, we're going to have an experience together and we're going to make memories and we're going to learn from it. Yeah, that's so good. Okay, so um, before we kind of wrap up this conversation, I have two questions that I like to ask every guest. First one is, what is something you're simplifying right now? Mm, finances. <laughs> I'm like in a, I'm in the midst of a deep dive for all things money. I've been on this for, gosh, maybe like 
I, the last year, like reading all the books and talking to all the people and <laughs> yeah, really diving deep about it, like debt-free living, FIRE. I'm a big fan of like financial independence, retire early, that whole movement. So I'm just reading all the things and doing all of the things. Um, my mother recently passed away. And so I'm the executive executor of her estate. So that has been really occupying for the last few months, a lot of my time and energy. Um, Like I said, she was kind of a functional hoarder. So that has certainly re-solidified my commitment to minimalism. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But also it has, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of simplifying for sure. Um, and there's a big financial component to that. So really finances are what I'm focused on simplifying right now. And in dealing with all of her her estate and all of her accounts and everything, I think that's causing me to um, shift a lot of how we have our finances set up as well. So it's good. It's, it's really good. And I'm learning so much and I'm feeling awesome about it. Um, but that's what I'm, that's like the deep dive that I'm on right now and in, in what I'm simplifying. Yeah. And I'm so sorry about your mom. Thank that's you. so hard, but, um, you know, thank you for just like being transparent and sharing what you're learning from all of that as well. Thank you. Yeah. And okay. So the, the last question is just kind of a fun one. What is something that you can't stop talking about right now? <laughs> it's something you're loving. <laughs> Money. So <laughs> the same thing. Like I keep talking about like all the books I'm reading that I'm loving and like playing with fire, your money or your life. Um, like all the Dave Ramsey goodness, which I know you had like debt kicking mom on yours and you guys talked yeah. a lot about that, like debt free living fire. I'm, I'm, that's kind of what I can't stop talking about right now. Can't stop, won't stop. And then next week I'm, or this week I am meeting with like, a an estate planning attorney to set up our will. So that's what I've been like talking a lot about, like setting up wills, which sounds like super boring and not exciting. But (laughs) but, like for, especially for people who have children, like this experience really taught me a lot with my mother that like when you pass away, this is your last act of love for your children or not like either right. them a mess. And then the, the last feeling that they have from you is that, I mean, this sounds super harsh, but like that you didn't care enough about them to, to leave this legacy of like, uh, of everything prepared and put together and simplified for them. Like yeah. hard, hard emphasis on the, the minimalism and the simplifying. So it's like something that I'm really excited to have peace of mind around that if I died in a car accident tomorrow, like I will be leaving my kids with, with this, this feeling that I was, I am loving them and taking care of them even through this transition of having to lose me. And that's yeah. what I want to leave them with. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's, I've never really thought of it that way. And you know, you're going through it. So it's something that you've learned and yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for this conversation. I feel like I could ask you a million more questions <laughs> and I've learned so much from you um, already, but where can, um, where can our listeners find you? Yeah. So sageparenting.com is my website. Head on over there, right on the homepage. You can opt in and get Um, like 12 steps to keep calm, cool and connected. And then that will just kind of sink you in to get emails that I send out. Um, Sage parenting on Instagram. I'm really active on Instagram. So if you follow me over there, you'll stay up to date on everything. Um, So keep in touch, follow along, reach out, say hi. I'd love to get to know all your listeners. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, And I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. You too. Thank you. I hope you love this episode, friend. I hope it gave you a lot to think about when it comes to gentle parenting, school in general, and inviting some adventure into your family's life. I know I say this every time, but I just want to encourage you, if you loved this episode, screenshot, listening in, and send it to a friend and share it with them, or share it on Instagram so that other moms can discover Minimalish as well. I know that this conversation was one that I just 
learned so much from. And the takeaways that I had from this conversation really stay with me, especially when I'm experiencing, you know, tougher times with my toddler. Make sure you head over to the Sage Family Podcast and give it a listen and head to Sage Parenting on Instagram. You are going to love following along with Rachel. And if you haven't followed along with me yet on Instagram, I'd love to see you there too, at Minimalish Podcast. All right, friend, that's really all I have for you today. And I hope to talk to you next week here on the show. I'll be talking with Courtney Carver. We talk a lot about being less busy, saying no, and how to take back our time. And we also talk about Project 333 and simplifying our wardrobes and kind of all things minimalism in general. I know you're going to love that episode, so don't miss it. Subscribe now so that you don't miss it. Until then, let's walk towards connectedness, adventure, and simplicity. Thank you.